Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Janine Ventura, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Interagency Collaboration and Innovation at the New York City Department for the Aging. Woo, yes. <laughs> I'm pleased to welcome all of you today in recognition of Older Americans Month, which takes place in May as well as introduce you to the work of the Cabinet for Older New Yorkers. The theme for this year, for Older Americans Month, is Aging Unbound, providing an opportunity to recognize the rich diversity in aging experiences and focus on how we as a community can combat age of stereotypes. And the Cabinet for Older New Yorkers works to do exactly that every day address the diverse experiences and needs among older adults, and fight ageism. Formed in September of last year, the Cabinet is an interagency collaborative established to realize and institutionalize age-inclusive New York City through structural, legislative, and systemic solutions. More than 20 city agencies comprise the Cabinet for Older New Yorkers, covering various facets of services and resources, including health, housing, public safety, social services, and transportation. You might have seen the op-ed in the Daily News this week kicking off Older Americans Month, underscoring the need for the work of the cabinet to advance an age-inclusive New York City. The cabinet pushes systems change among services and access, practices, policies, and legislation, and innovation. Today, we will highlight several of the initiatives launched under the cabinet. These initiatives cover education, intergenerational work, health, and pedestrian safety. So first, as the anti-ageism movement starts with education, through the Cabinet for Older New Yorkers, New York City Public Schools piloted an anti-ageism resource guide in 13 high schools in Brooklyn South. The guide provides educational resources and tools on how students, the next generation of our city's leaders, can recognize ageism understand its impact, and serve as change agents to advance inclusion. About 1,350 students are participating in this pilot, reaching their families, yes, woo, that's amazing. <laughs> that is impact, and that is reach. Their families and communities through anti-ageism school-based education. Now, I would like to welcome Principal Natasha Jack of the School for Human Rights in Brooklyn to talk more about her school's experience since the resource guide was piloted earlier this year. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here as an educator to speak to you about the work that my young adults are doing at my high school. And so according to the Brooklyn High School Superintendent Michael Prayer, the most valued members of our communities are elderly, and we must connect to our elders. This is where the pilot initiated for the 13 high schools of Brooklyn South. As the principal of an innovative high school in Southern Brooklyn, I understood the call and eagerly joined the pilot. Our mission at the high school is centered on empowering our students to be innovative, critical thinkers, but ultimately productive change agents of society. We inspire to have all of our graduates be motivated, lifelong learners who are equipped to be and build a more just and equitable world. It's, it was fundamental for me to have all 72 of my seniors engage in this work. And so our students have integrated the pilot into their economics course. And my students are running a student-led podcast every Friday where they are talking about deep issues that impact older adults, but also older adults. And we are really combating the last ism, we like to say, of ageism. The pilot for us promotes the understanding and it promotes empathy. Learning about ageism is helping my students understand the experiences of older adults. This is further helping my seniors and my scholars develop a more positive attitude towards aging and older adults, which will improve the intergenerational relationships. According to one of my seniors, Devante, he says, I have experienced ageism at my job with older coworkers, and I didn't even know there was a name for it. But I have also treated older people like my aunt, my grandmother differently sometimes, calling them old fashioned because of their age, but this too is also a problem. 
The pilot encourages critical thinking. Infusing ageism into the economics course intentionally is promoting, promoting critical thinking and is helping my students develop a more nuanced understanding of some of the complex social issues related to ageism, such as credit, finances, social security. This is helping my students to identify and challenge ageist stereotypes and biases. According to one of the teachers leading the pilot, she says ageism is the last ism that has been allowed to be prevalent in society with no real outrage or pushback. I think the only way to combat is to bring different age groups together to see both their successes and their struggles to build commonality, which will help tear down these stereotypes. It fosters this sense of social responsibility for our young adults. Let's encourage and empower our scholars to take action to address age-related biases and discrimination. So at the School for Human Rights as a principal, we plan to go deeper, we plan to look for more partners, and we plan to continue to extend the learning and provide a platform to teach our students to learn about ageism and how they can help promote a more positive and inclusive society for all people of all ages. So I thank you for listening. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Principal Jack. And exactly what she just mentioned is what we'll be talking about in the next initiative in terms of sharing the struggles, sharing the successes to build that community. So the next initiative, led by the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, continues the anti-ageism movement by building community intergenerational connections through shared New York stories. My New York Story is a program that seeks to develop a network for community leadership, problem solving, and support grounded in multi-generational work and understanding. With about 100 participants, including older adults and youth, across 10 New York City Housing Authority developments citywide, with co-located cornerstone programs and older adult centers, storytelling is used to cultivate intergenerational cohesion in these communities. This initiative aims to dismantle stereotypes through intergenerational engagement and relationship building, and participant surveys so far show positive changes in perception. I would now like to introduce Jamari Reynolds, who is a high school student participating in the New My New York Story program. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamari Reynolds, and I am in 10th grade at Lehman High School in the Bronx, and I just turned 16 last week. I've been a part of my New York Story program at East Chester, not for a really long time, but I've been there enough to know like what we talk about. And <laughs> and through this program, I've learned a lot from my older adults and my peers. In small groups, we like to talk about our different life experiences, like what they went through through school and what how what they went through during school and what I go through during school now. So we compared differences. The older adults shared how different education is, how different education is compared to when they were in school and how I was. I mentioned what it's like to travel to school, like how MCA is now from before. It was definitely a lot slower back then. <laughs> but I think we can I think we can definitely all agree. This program definitely also taught me about ageism. I learned about how it definitely exists in New York City and how lots of older adults go through it. And they experience this oppression very often, daily, weekly, monthly, occasionally. I also learned how to recognize it and how to address it, which is really one of the biggest lessons I took away. I enjoy being a part of this program and sharing stories with adults with other adults in my community. I look forward to more exchanges with my older adults and more about my neighbors and learning their history. Thank you. Thank you, Jamari. So now please welcome Mildred Gore, who is a My New York Story participant as well at the same site. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, thank you very much for having us here. And I'd like to um, let you know that my name is Mildred Gore. I am a member of Rain East Chester Adult Center in the Bronx, where I'm also the secretary for the advisory council. My husband and I have been members of Rain Older Adult Center since 2014 when I retired. And this, and this June, we'll be celebrating 24 years of marriage. Thank you, thank you. I am also participating in my story program. The stories we share highlight the Harlem experience. We talked about Harlem then and now and the rich history of the neighborhood. We shared stories about our legendary Apollo Theater and the iconic artists who got their start or were featured on the stage Apollo is a cultural institution which we are excited to talk about. From this experience, I actually was very surprised about how kind our youth are to the older adults. We hit it off as soon as we all met one another. We laughed, we shared stories. It has been a wonderful, con it is wonderful to connect and relate to one another through this program and just to be together as human beings and neighbors in the same community. I have, I have now forged a friendship with youth in my community, which I might not have had outside of this program. Sharing stories and interacting with youth has changed my perspective on younger generation and I have learned from them and vice versa. I am happy to be part of this experience. I look forward to celebrating and reflecting on how they will collectively grow together. And I wanted to just outline one special thing that let us all know that the youth and the elders can be together. My husband's 80 years old and he's on TikTok. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok. And the young people had a laugh about that. So thank you all very much. God bless you. And hopefully this po program will go forward. It is extremely needed. So sidebar, I'm so excited that Mildred shared that because she shared that earlier and I was totally going to include that if she wasn't going to include that. So what I won't share is her husband's handle because <laughs> The youth definitely took an interest in that. So if you thought you heard the punchline, there's a better punchline. So to empower aging in place, frontline health professionals recognize that older adult patients and caregivers may need additional support and resources beyond healthcare to maintain their wellness. The cabinet worked to address this by instituting a training and conducting feedback sessions to raise awareness about existing community-based services available for older New Yorkers. So far, more than 200 frontline health professionals were trained from the city's public health corps, comprised of community health workers from New York City Health and Hospitals and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, geriatricians and social workers also from h and and DOHMH, and the mayor's public engagement unit's public health educators. I now would like to introduce Leticia Cisneros, a community health worker who's part of the Public Health Corps in Adult Medicine at Health and Hospitals Woodhull, who took the training to share her takeaway. Sorry. We went easier when we were but see sides. Hello, my name is Leticia Cisneros, and I work for the Public Health Corp. At the New York City Health and Hospitals, as a community health worker, we work with a wide range of patients with a combination of medical and social needs. Older patients can face challenges, including scheduling, getting to appointments, food and financial insecurity, and for in need for social support. We help patients connect to their medical providers by setting up and showing them how to use my portal chart, assisting with scheduling appointments, arranging transportation, and helping them applying for government benefits and other resources. It can be hard to find social support for older people. Many 
need in-home support, not only to assist with their medical needs and household activities, but also for a companionship to combat social isolation. Undocumented patients have an even more difficult time getting these type of resources and support, are limited in terms for the benefits that they can receive. We found that the training is being helpful with identifying resources to provide home care assistance to the aging population. For example, one of our patients, it's a 60 years old woman with multiple health issues who recently lost her husband and emotional support who used to help her a lot. Uh, we perform a home visit help, we perform the visit, home visit and we, that make us to understand the social support that she needs. And we was able to keep up with her, um, she was unable to keep up with her medications and regimen performing activities for daily living due to being unaware and feeling depressed. We all know how hard it is to have a loss. Um, we was able to walk her through the process of getting home health aid services and sh then she was approved for daily services and now she's feeling more stable. Thank you all. Thank you, Leticia. Now please welcome Natasha McIntosh White, community health worker supervisor, who works with Leticia at Woodhull to also share. Good evening, cabinet members and all NYC agencies. I think you would all agree with me that the word for tonight is collaboration and just ensuring that our aging population remains connected to resources in the community and that all um, other departments are helping them to continue to remain connected to those resources. And that's one of the main things that we do here at Health and Hospitals is just um, ensuring that they are able to navigate the various systems that they are connected to once they graduate our program that Leticia was speaking about. One of the resources that we learned about during the training uh, that we took with the older um, with the um, services of the older adults that was especially helpful was the availability for services um, of case management in the home for the patient so that patients and the older population can remain in home uh, while they continue to age. Uh, in general, just remaining, uh, just continuing to collaborate with the Department of Aging and learning about a range of available resources that we can continue to connect this population to has been extremely helpful for us. Uh, our team here at Health and Hospitals is always learning about newer resources, but sometimes it can be difficult to find those resources um, and just to have the option of connecting our patients to. And it's just important for us to have some sort of assistance to turn to. So just the fact that we have the Department of Aging to reach out to has been super helpful for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natasha. Age-inclusive older adult pedestrian planning is imperative as older New Yorkers age 60 plus comprise less than 20% of the city's population, yet account for more than 45% of pedestrian fatalities. The New York City Department of Transportation is leading walkability audits and hosting feedback sessions with older adult center members living in areas slated for Vision Zero work. I would now like to introduce Michael Fandel, member of the Carter Bird and Luncheon Club, to talk about being part of the recent walking audit led by DOT. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Fandel, and I've been a member of the uh, Carter Burden Center on East 74th Street for over uh, 10 years. I also retired from the NYPD after 20 years and was a uh, New York City substitute teacher for 35 years. My very first New York City Marathon was with its founder, Fred LeBeau, who is in remission from brain cancer. And on, excuse me, on Marathon Day, the entire city becomes a room. 
where people locally, internationally, and from all walks of life share this space. Similarly, last week, when the New York City Department of Transportation led a walkability tour in the neighborhood with myself and other older adult center members, every corner we turned and each area we covered became a room. The room was filled with good feelings, flowing and deep appreciation for the strategies applied to enhance safety for uh, pedestrians, <clears throat> as well as bicyclists and motorists. It reminded me of the famous beloved song from the Broadway musical, South Pacific. Some enchanted evening, you may find a stranger across a crowded room. Touring the neighborhood and providing feedback as community residents who walk these blocks and streets every day help to inform how we can better navigate this crowded room and ensure we and all the strangers we may encounter as uh, pedestrians remain safe. I am grateful to the Department of Transportation for leading the initiative, engaging other uh, older adults for input and enriching our experience while walking, observing, and relating. I appreciated the many more eyes and ears in the group during the walkability tour recognizing that visuals are important, realizing you have to make an estimate based on the count at the light and observing the traffic calming devices. The experience was memorable, memorable and rewarding. And before I say thank you, I'll do an ad lib. You knock my socks off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. After working with Michael for several days, I had a feeling he was going to close with a joke. So <laughs> I appreciated that one. So, um, so thank you, and thank you to all of the speakers for sharing their experiences of being part of this cabinet work on the ground. Um, we also just recently launched a website at nyc.gov forward slash cabinet for older New Yorkers. I would also like to express deep gratitude to all of the cabinet member agencies for their work every day in service of older New Yorkers and ensuring we truly are a city inclusive of all ages. And while this concludes this portion of the program, please stick around as the mayor will be sharing and speaking shortly. Thank you. I am Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom. I'm the Deputy Mayor, thank you, for Health and Human Services which means that I have the best job in the city. So there is a lot of interesting things about me. I'm getting ready to celebrate my 31st wedding anniversary with my husband. My 30-year-old daughter just got married. I have three kids. I live in Harlem. There's all these great things. But the best thing about me is that I have had the pleasure of most of my life to take care of and to love and to live with right now my 92-year-old mom, Miss Edna. So, loving Miss Edna means that I understand this issue more than you can understand, right? This woman came here from Trinidad and Tobago. She was a single mom. Her, the foundation that she has let and led for my brothers and I really is the light that is the future of all the most beautiful things in my life. And I know each one of us in here, and so now as I'm a caretaker of her, it just makes me filled up more and makes me know that this part of my life and to have her with me makes me a better person, a better wife, a better mother, and a better deputy mayor. All right. We all know that we have people in our life older adults who do that for us. And this is why this issue is so important at this moment. So when the commissioner came to me and said that she wanted to have a cabinet for older adults, I couldn't have been more excited. And so my goal tonight is just to thank you, to tell you why this interagency effort of all of us, a whole government effort, because that's what the mayor always wants from us, is to cut out those silos and see people for who they are and see people for their humanity. And so tonight, that's what this is a celebration of. So with that, I think the most important thing that I want to do is 
is I want to bring up our fearless leader and the person who has had the vision for what New York City older adults should experience. And so it is my pleasure to bring up the commissioner of the Department of Aging. I call her LCV, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. Lorraine? She does. She does. She had, um, thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, I'm LCV. Um, thank you. Welcome to Gracie Mansion. Uh, let me start by first thanking uh, Mayor Eric Adams for opening his home to all of you tonight. And uh, because he's a strong advocate for older workers yes, and for older. Dor Dorothy's son, we should call him. Oh, and Dorothy's son. One of the ways that I, one of, I'm ad living now, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> but he always, when he talks, he always talks about his mother and how she was so central to his uh, well-being and all everything that he talks about. It's about his mother. And that was the insight that we had into how strong an advocate he is for older adults. So this is not just words for him. This is commitment and passion, lifelong commitment and passion. When he was borough president, I saw firsthand how he worked with older adults, Norks and other uh, centers, and he helped Brooklynites place a great program called Age Friendly in place. Brooklyn was a leader in Age Friendly. And we're really proud because just recently we unveiled all of the work that has been done that he did in Brooklyn under Age Friendly. But now as mayor, I'm so proud to work with him to advance these practices across the city to create an age inclusive city. He has seen that vision. As you saw during the presentations, that weren't they amazing, those presentations yeah. of those young people and older adults? <laughs> One way or another, every agency has an effect on the lives of older adults. And Mayor Adams made a commitment to bring them all together. And I never forget his words during, when we launched the cabinet, when he launched the cabinet, which was, I'm counting on you to tell me what to do to make this a better city for older adults. And those were his words. So he created this cabinet to break silos, as the deputy mayor said, to identify gaps, streamline processes, as he always says, collaborate, and he always says upstream strategies, and then to recommend legislation and policy agendas, making New York the model age-inclusive city. With over 20 agencies on board, the representative of those agencies every day keep us safe, housed, educated, healthy, enrich our cultural experiences. And um, also, you can see that the aging cabinet is the storyboards here, and some of them are here, so I want to thank them. I want to thank my colleague and friend for more than 35 years, that he's going to be a grandfather and he's still here. <laughs> you know? Um, so you, every, every one of the members of this cabinet make this work possible. Each one of them has made a commitment, has taken the mayor's words to heart. Since its creation in, 70, in 1975, Department for, for the Aging relied on community-based agencies to do this work. We don't do this work directly. We rely on partnerships. Today, many of those are still with us and are partners on the ground. Why? They know the neighborhood. They know the community. They know older adults. They know the music that they love. They know the food that they want. They know the dances that they want to do. They know uh, what they are. And so we could not do this without our community partners. Older adults are going to start outnumbering the younger population. And we know that it is not an either or city. This is a city of all. And so what we need to do is to make sure that we envision a city that works for both. And some of the projects that you talked, we, you heard this evening were about just that. The experiences shared today are important. The work would not have been possible without the support of the first deputy mayor. She embraced this when she first heard about the cabinet, which was just created seven months ago. And never would this be possible with the steady hand and support of our DM Ann. Uh, she is a strong, strong advocate. And of course, none of this is possible with the man who lives in his, this house and who had the vision to go from age-friendly 
to age inclusive. It is my honor to bring to you Mayor Eric Adams. Thank, thank you so much, and really thank all of you and the long friendship and relationship I have had with the commissioner for so many years. And as I, we were running for office, I knew I had my commission of the Department of Aging, and you know she was trying to think she was going to retire, and I said, "You're not going anywhere. <laughs> you know you could you could hang that up. Uh, uh, you you have a job to do, and that commitment." and being thoughtful, it is so important when we look at this cabinet and those of you who are here and part of the cabinet, some of our elected officials that are here as well. Because that report that came out, uh, I think two days ago, that uh, talked about the impact of loneliness and its predeterminants uh, to health. And we have been talking about this in, with our team for a long time, uh, how what loneliness does in the equivalence of smoking several packs of cigarettes a day. And we have to think differently about addressing the issue uh, that many of our older adults are experiencing. You know, many of them have family members that are no longer there. Uh, many of them are shut in for whatever reason they cannot travel. Uh, it, is ex it was important to me uh, that as the commissioner stated, that let's go out and find out from our older adults what it is to navigate this city. They were here uh, to make this city what it is and they cannot be uh, displaced or we cannot create a city that's so hip and cool that we don't understand those who built the city in the first place. And I don't know, my mom used to tell me, you know, that when I tell her, you know, mommy, you know, you need to come in and move in with me. You're 80 something years old. She said, listen, I don't want you to see when my boo comes over, you know. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and so let's not kid ourselves. Our older adults still want to do things that are enjoyable. They want to go out. They want to be in the theater. They want to move around our transportation system. They want to learn how to use uh, the various technologies that are available. You know, just because you move slower, uh, you are dealing with some ailments. Just because, you know, life has changed, it does not mean the energy and the youthfulness of one's existence dissipates at the same time. And it's our role to make sure that we keep it going. And I'll tell you something else as I conclude. We need them more than ever. Our young people really need that guidance. And we have to be extremely focused and intentional about how do we do an intergenerational relationship between our young people and our older adults. Their wisdom is real. Uh, you know, there's whatever we are going through, they have gone through. It may be just a different time and a different moment, uh, but it's the same experience. And that wisdom, that knowledge, that nurturing, that caring, particularly in an environment where many of our young people uh, don't have that foundation at home, uh, many of our older adults are really open arms and really want to contribute uh, to the young people and the generations that is uh, coming into being. And they want to be active. Uh, I, I got beat the other day by some of our older adults on pickleball. They. <laughs> They, you know, I got on the court, thought I was going to be all good, and they looked at each other and they said, we're going to wipe the floor with you, young man. And they did just that. <laughs> you know, so there's some real active things that we can do. And so I just really want to thank the commissioner and the entire, entire team and the entire cabinet of the energy that you're bringing to this conversation. And we really want to let the globe see what we are doing should cascade throughout the entire country that as we progress in years, we want to maintain the dignity and respect that we deserve. Because, you know, I have my AARP card, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I know what it is. And finally, I want to say thank you to George Holtz, who's here uh, from Emblem Health. Uh, George has sponsored so many things here. We have so many events here. 
And George has really been an amazing friend and partner. You know, thank you so much for what you have done and what you will continue to do, and all the partners, part, uh, sponsors who participated. But again, thank you so much for coming here and being part of this event. Thank you.